few media corporations in the world today are as influential or as widely used as Facebook. The social networking site was launched by Mark Zuckerberg and his confederates as a website for Harvard University students in 2004, and has since become a publicly trading corporation worth more than $40 billion in total assets and employing over 10,000 people. By 2013, it was reported that more than half the world's internet population used Facebook. How has this been achieved? Through the simple expedience of harnessing popular narcissism. In the beginning, the Harvard Yearbook was a way for students to see themselves and their achievements listed for peer approbation. It was compared by the Harvard Crimson to a website named Friendster, wherein people could find similarly minded individuals and create a network of friends. But it was also compared by the same publication to the popular website Hot or Not, wherein people would load pictures of themselves onto the site and get ratings from users on a scale of 1 to 10. In the ensuing versions of the website, features like these were dropped, but the like button performed a similar, more subtle function on Facebook. Rather than being ranked, which might leave some users feeling aggrieved at their overall score, one could just accumulate an indefinite number of likes. In this respect, the widely used term social networking site is inadequate. It is a social narcissism site. The like button is as important as the friend button to getting you hooked on Facebook. In this review, we're talking about the technology, the profit strategies, and above all, the politics of Facebook. All new popular phenomena attract elements of moral panic and over-the-top opposition by people committed to the idea that there's something more authentic about technologically less sophisticated ways of living. An early reaction by Idler editor Tom Hodgkinson, with friends like Lee's published in The Guardian, was typical in suggesting that Facebook would just make people more selfish and less likely to communicate in real life. Traditional right-wing newspapers such as the Daily Mail trade on lurid stories about Facebook undermining moral fiber and damaging your child's brain. But this is not just the response of reactionaries. CBS asks how real a risk is social media addiction and reports on a new phenomenon being noised abroad, so-called internet addiction disorder, wherein people grow so inured to the release of dopamine as a result of the likes, the comments, and the retweets that they receive that they can't stop themselves checking their social media feeds every few minutes. Social media marketer Jason Thibault wrote a widely shared post about abandoning Facebook in order to break his addiction. And indeed, such declarations are quite a regular feature for people who use the site. Friends declaring that in order to reclaim some control over their lives, they are abandoning Facebook. Psychiatrists in Munich have now added Facebook addiction to their ever-proliferating list of modern disorders, according to the Journal of European Psychiatry. Psychologists at the University of Bergen have developed a Facebook addiction scale to help place patients in relation to the supposed extent of their dependency. And there is some tentative evidence that the regular use of Facebook changes the brain structure of users, as The Guardian reports, that those with more friends develop more brain activity and more gray matter in regions of the brain associated with memory, emotion, and social interaction. CBS reports on a number of studies suggesting that the changes to brain structure are similar to those affecting substance abusers. It quotes the researchers saying that internet addiction disorder may share psychological and neural mechanisms with other types of substance addiction and impulse control disorders. Bill Davidoff, summarizing similar reports in The Atlantic, argues that as we become able to shape our online environment more perfectly around our needs, we become more narcissistic. He then adds that narcissists are setting many of the benchmarks for everyday users. Everyday users get caught up in popularity contests and experience anxieties. Some report becoming depressed because they're being out-twittered and are lacking in thumbs up. The emergence of new addictions and disorders is simply a routine feature of the medicalization of social phenomena something that has been built into the approach of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders since 1980, wherein disorders are defined against a normality that exists nowhere. The real question avoided by much of the news-based commentary is what role narcissism plays in the profit-making strategies of Zuckerberg and his colleagues. What is Facebook's business model, given that it doesn't charge users for any of the services it provides, 
from the news feed and timeline to the messenger function. Basically, there are two key sources of revenue. One is payments from developers who use the site to promote apps and games. But the overwhelming source of revenue, making up 85% of income in 2011, is from advertisers. In other words, the platform is designed as an optimal marketing platform. Its use of likes and networking, its organization and management of personal relations and emotions, and its manipulation of narcissism is designed to keep the user in a receptive state for advertisers. At any rate, there are more pressing political reasons to be concerned by some of the infrastructures that Facebook and social networking sites like it are laying in place. One of the most irritating aspects of the entire silicon capital sector from Google to Facebook is its tiresome sense of progressive self-righteousness. While they cheerfully avoid taxes, as The Guardian reported, Facebook paid no corporation tax last year for the second year running, they also appear to align with liberal democratic politics. Facebook's innovation of a simple app allowing users to add a rainbow to their profile picture in response to the US Supreme Court's gay marriage decision, reported by Time magazine, was an extremely low-cost way of affecting this alignment. Far more grotesque and more insidious was the wave of obnoxious celebrations of Facebook as a force for revolution in the context of 2011, Tahrir Square, and the early days of the Arab Spring. The habitual phrase, Twitter revolutions, suggested that there was a necessary connection between democratic rights and the spread of communications technology. A typical argument along these lines was provided by Jose Antonio Vargas in the New York Times Sunday Book Review, in which he claimed that the Egyptian revolution which overthrew Hosni Mubarak began on Facebook. Chris Taylor, who manages the technology website Mashable, agreed, telling CNN that it was a Facebook revolution. CNN extolled Egypt's Revolution 2.0. In fact, while a small number of important activists did use Facebook to spread information, and the Egyptian Google executive Wild Ghanem did the network a tremendous service by publicly thanking it for its role, as reported in the Huffington Post, most Egyptians who revolted had no access to Facebook. Such networks were important for a highly educated, literate, and largely middle-class layer. But notably, Mubarak's attempt to control the revolt by shutting down internet services did him no favors. And as the BBC noted, even in technological terms, more important than Facebook, was the fact that 80% of Egyptians used mobile phones at this time and were able to record repression and ensure it was broadcast across the Arab world. The predictable backlash articles against such techno-utopianism, such as Malcolm Gladwell's New York Times piece, does Egypt need Twitter, missed the point entirely. He noted, as if no one had thought of this, that people protested and brought down governments before Facebook was invented. As if the question was not what sorts of politics Facebook enabled. If Facebook claims credit for contributing to democratic politics, what can be said about its role in repression? A little known case from the UK of Azar Ahmed convicted for a Facebook post, illustrates how Facebook can be used for surveillance. The BBC reports that Ahmed was convicted for a soldier's death slur. In fact, what he said was, in response to reports of war crimes in Afghanistan, was that the soldiers should burn in hell. This emotionally overwrought political statement was deemed fit for punishment as a grossly offensive communication. That is, precisely because the opinion was expressed on Facebook, it was fit for a sentence. Facebook itself operates as a vast data collection tool aggregating user information. It retains all information uploaded by users and servers based in the United States, including that which had been deleted by the user. And as Forbes reports, its current policies enable it to sell whatever aspects of your online profile it wishes. As The Guardian reports, the European Court of Justice has decided that this leaves users in a precarious position as following the Edward Snowden revelations about the NSA accessing mass server data in the US, it is clear that their information is not safe from US government surveillance. The risk is not just state surveillance, of course. There's also corporate surveillance and the rising phenomenon of cyber stalking, wherein users obsess over other users' statuses, photographs, and online interactions. Soon, Facebook will become 
a far more efficient source of data mining, as the BBC reports that the site is indexing over 1.5 trillion posts by its users over the years in order to allow them to be found by other users. This could be seen as a move intended to diffuse criticism of Facebook's practices of hoarding data in order to sell it on by giving users some advantages in exchange for their data being used in this way. And this is the problem that all of the moral panic and all of the misguided or oversimplified criticism ultimately boils down to. The technology and its clearly prodigious promise has slipped out of our control and its effects, whatever they are, are happening without our being able to understand or account for them adequately. The only thing that is certain is that Facebook has developed a highly profitable way of monetizing people's need for attention, admiration and friendship. That's the Facebook revolution.